In this uh, part two of why eschatology is important, I want to touch on some uh, modern day Christian prophetic beliefs uh, to show you how Christians uh, view prophecy and their attitudes towards the world in which they live. And these are some quotations I have accumulated over the years and it will give you some uh, idea of, of how, how this affects uh, our, the way we operate in the world. H how do we fight against aggressive, uh, humanistic, militant eschatologies if we have a view that says, man, you can't change anything. There is no possibility of changing. Jesus said things are supposed to get worse and worse before he, came, he comes back. Uh, here's, uh, here's what one individual has said. Uh, this world is not going to get any easier to live in. Almost unbelievably hard times lie ahead. In Je indeed, Jesus said that these coming days will be uniquely terrible. Nothing in all the previous history of the world can, can compare with what lies in store for mankind. So when Christians hear that, they say, man, there's nothing we can do. This is, this is all going to come down on our heads. Uh, of course, we're going to be rescued out of this. The rapture is going to take place. Uh, but, but what do we say to Christians around the world who are being persecuted for, for, for Christ? They're going through a period of tribulation. Just recently there was a, a church in Iraq uh, where uh, Islamic radicals went in there and, uh, tried to, and, and, and took over this church by, by taking 100 people hostage, and I believe more than 50 people were killed as a result. Uh, they're living out the implications of all this. Why isn't this taking place in America? The reason it's not taking place in America because there's still something of a remnant of a Christian worldview here. When that goes, when that remnant goes, and then you have millions of Christians who say this is all part of some sort of end-time prophetic scenario, uh, then you're going to see a collapse of the United States as well. But even that won't be an indication that we're living in the end times because it's happened before in history. Here's another quotation. What a way to live, with optimism, with anticipation, with excitement. We should be living like persons who don't expect to be around much longer. See, how, how do you build a ministry? How do you build a church? How do you build a society based upon that operating presupposition? A another person says, I don't like cliches, but I've heard it said, God didn't send me to clean the fishbowl. He sent me to fish. In a way, there's a truth in that. He said, look, we're not supposed to be worried about this world and how dirty it is and so forth. What we're supposed to do is just we're supposed to, uh, you know, f take the, the, the fish out of this, uh, of, of, this, uh, of this world. Of course, if you take fish out of its environment, they die. Uh, and if you don't clean the fish bowl, they die as well. Uh, and uh, we've been hearing this sort of thing for, for quite some time. There, an, another interesting phrase is, is that you don't, you don't polish brass on a sinking ship. Uh, you, you don't rearrange the deck chairs on the Titanic. And so America is like a, t a Titanic going down. Why bother with all that? What we need to do is just get in the rescue, get in the lifeboat so we can be rescued by Jesus at the end of history. Another person has written, the premillennial position sees no obligation to make distinctly Christian laws. And yet, if that's the case, then why are we out there pushing as various ministries and churches out there, and there are Christians out there, many of whom are dispensationalists, uh, many of them whom do believe in, in, in the end times, trying to make distinctly Christian laws. Why are we bothering with any of that? It's schizophrenic. And after a while, you'll find people getting weary of trying to change laws when in the back of their minds they can say, look, Jesus is coming back soon. If you really don't believe in, so, in some sort of cultural advancement through the application of the Bible to every area of life, the passing a law here or there or stopping this particular law here or there just doesn't make sense. Ted Peters writes that dispensationalism functions to justify social irresponsibility and many find this doctrine a comfort in their lethargy. Now, I am not saying that all people who believe that we're living in the last, last days are in fact ineffectual when it comes to making changes in their culture. That's not the case at all. But there are certainly millions of Christians out there who have no regard for this world whatsoever. Uh, and and I, ha I have the emails to prove it. Uh, any, one of the reasons, in fact, I got involved in dealing with the issue of eschatology is because when I went out to speak on worldview issues, especially on my three-volume God and Government series, I find Christians, you know, sending up an objection saying, why are we bothering with all this since Jesus promised he was going to come back soon? Now, there have been criticisms uh, of, of, of this type of thinking for quite some time. Let me give you a couple of these. 
William Edgar, who's a professor of apologetics at Westminster Theological Seminary, uh, recounts the time in the 1960s when he spent time studying at Labrie, uh, Switzerland, under the tutelage of Francis Schaeffer, who we mentioned in the first, in the first segment. And, and here's what Edgar writes. He says, um, I can remember coming down the mountain from Labrie and expecting the stock market to cave in, a priestly elite to take over American government, and enemies to poison the drinking water. I was almost disappointed when these things did not happen. Then he goes on and he speculates with good reason that it was Schaefer's eschatology that negatively affected the way he saw and interpreted world events. Uh, one of Schaefer's last books, A Christian Manifesto, called for civil disobedience as a stopgap measure to postpone an inevitable societal decline. And that's what is interesting. When you go back and you study the history of Francis Schaefer's works, you will see that his most powerful book and the one that sold the most copies in a short matter of time was A Christian Manifesto. And, but in that particular book he says it was civil disobedience was our solution. Not cultural transformation, not the slow work, the slow progress of redeeming institutions bit by bit over time. He didn't have the eschatology for it. So he wrote a book uh, that, that said, look, maybe the next step in all of this is to, um, uh, to, to, to to rebel in a disobedient way to the, to the powers that be. Well, again, for what, for what ultimate purpose? What would that do? So let's say we overturn the existing order. They, there still is this premise that we're living in the last days. Uh, Tom Sign offers a startling example of the effect of prophetic inevitability uh, and, what, and uh, what it can have on people, the attitude it can have on people. So he says, um, this is, he was at a particular seminar, and he starts off this way. Do you realize if we start feeding hungry people, things won't get worse, and if things don't get worse, Jesus won't come? Interrupted a co-ed during a futures uh, interterm I recently conducted at a Northwest Christian college. Her tone of voice and her serious expression revealed she was utterly sincere. And unfortunately, I've discovered the co-ed's question doesn't reflect an isolated viewpoint. Rather, it betrays a widespread misunderstanding of biblical eschatology that seems to permeate much contemporary Christian consciousness. I believe this misunderstanding of God's intentions for the human future is seriously undermining the effectiveness of the people of God in carrying out His mission in a world of need. The response of the student reflects what I call the great escape view of the future. So much of the popular prophetic literature has focused our attention morbidly on the dire, the dreadful, and the destruction of all that is. And again, uh, you might say, again, I don't hold this position, uh, but there are millions of Christians out there who do hold this position. There are those who say, I'm, uh, I'm not going to get involved in, in politics, for example. Uh, why should I? Uh, it's, it, it's run by the devil. You know, Satan is the god of this world, uh, biblical truth, it says, God of this age, and it was an age that was passing away. But Satan is in control down here. Even though in Matthew chapter 28, says, Jesus says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to him. And as a result of that, he sends us out into the world to make disciples of all the nations. Uh, but there is this mindset that, that, uh, that, that seems to uh, uh, pacify the activism of Christians in the world. Now, there, there is a gradual shift taking place, but even so, the eschatological uh, impetus for this has not been engaged. Uh, Joseph Zahn is a, another example of someone who has been critical of an end time speculative theology and the, eff and the effect it can have on uh, somebody's activism. Uh, Joseph Zahn is a Romanian Baptist pastor who had been imprisoned for his faith under the communist regime. Uh, in Romania, and uh, what I'm going to read for you is uh, from a speech that he, commencement address that he gave at Wheaton College back in the 19 uh, by, back in the 1990s. He says, "Let me illustrate the importance of understanding the times from my own experience. The communist disaster fell on my country of Romania when I was a teenager. For many years after that, my life was a battle for intellectual and spiritual survival." under Marxist indoctrination and totalitarian and Christian terror. I struggled to understand the nature of that calamity, and the Lord gave me that understanding. In the 40s, I wrote papers on the nature of the failure of communism. One of them, published under the title The Christian Manifesto, landed me in six months of house arrest 
with harsh interrogations by the secret police. But for me, the crucial moment came in 1977 when a friend of mine challenged me to set up an organization that would openly expose communism. Uh, here's what I told him. Communism is an experiment that has failed. It wasn't able to fulfill any of its many promises and nobody believes in it anymore. Because of this, it will one day collapse on its own. Now why should I fight something that is finished? I believe that our task is a different one. When communism collapses, somebody has to be there to rebuild society. I believe our job as Christian teachers is to train leaders so that they will be ready and capable to rebuild our society on a Christian basis. To my surprise, here is what my friend said to me. Joseph, you are wrong. Communism will triumph all over the world because this is the movement of the Antichrist. And when the communists take over in the United States, they will have no restraining force left. They will then kill all the Christians. We have only one job to do, to alert the world and make ready to die. A few years later, my friend was forced to leave Romania. He came to the U.S. and settled down. Then I was forced into exile, and I moved to the U.S. as well. Since then, my friend has not done anything for Romania. He simply waited for the final triumph of communism and the annihilation of Christianity. On the other hand, when I came here in 1981, I started a training program for Christian leaders in Romania. We translated Christian textbooks and smuggled them into Romania. With our partners in the organization, the Biblical Education by Extension, we trained about 1,200 people all over Romania. Today, those people who were trained in an underground operation are the leaders in churches, in evangelical denominations, and in key Christian ministries. The C you see, the way you look to the future determines your planning and your actions. It is the way you understand the times that determines what you are going to do. Peter Gilquist uh, offers a great summary to all of this. He says, Can the world be changed? Are the people of God even to expect such a thing? Isn't the world utterly and hopelessly lost? The world can be changed. The church has changed the world before and it can do it again. The impact of the ancient church altered the character of the massive Roman Empire. It didn't make it perfect, mind you, but it did make the world more bearable, a better place for both believer and unbeliever to live. Consider the issues of just treatment for slaves, care of unwanted children, the poor, widows, and the sick and lame as a few examples of areas where the historic church has made a visible and powerful difference. And the reason for that was is that, that they had an optimistic view of the future. They believed that the gospel would permeate every area of society if they were faithful in taking the gospel there. Their eschatology was one of true belief that change can take place because God is not only the God of the past and the God of the present, but God of the future.